Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. And welcome to the show. I'm Danica DiGiorgio, filling in tonight for Peter Credlin. Here's what's coming up. The big Australia push is going bust. At least that's what a new report shows us, with housing absolutely failing to keep pace with record levels of immigration. However, given how reliant the government has become on immigration to boost the budget bottom line, will anything actually change? Another dive in news poll for Labor with real problems emerging in the West and perhaps surprisingly with younger voters. This is good news for Dutton, but the reality is there is still more work to be done by the Coalition. Plus more rank hypocrisy from the hapless Chris Bowen, whose climate credentials are in serious doubt after himself and the PM took separate jets to the same location to spruik their green agenda. And as I'll explain shortly, Labor has form when it comes to chartering private jets. And speaking of Bowen, the minister was back out there today defending his revamped emissions standard and the lack of transparency around it. In fact, he went as far as to say the very same car companies that pushed back on this policy are the ones who want the public in the dark. The one I know most about is the, is the vehicle efficiency standards consultations, obviously. And in that instance, as car companies came to us and said they wanted to share commercial and confidence data with the government um, and ask for the negotiations or the consultations to be held in that light. And so we agreed to that. But first, the sheer hypocrisy of Labor. To lecture us about green energy and reducing the carbon footprint, yet take a look at this shocker. Albo and his energy minister, Blackout Bowen, flew separately in two private jets to the Hunter last week to attend the same event. Now, this story was first revealed by Ben Fordham on 2GB this morning. An eagle-eyed local snapped this picture of the Falcon 7X planes on the tarmac at Scone that Albo and Bo Bowen flew in separately to make, well, would you believe... An environmental announcement about solar panels at the site of the former coal-fired Liddell power station. Now, the irony in this is incredible. You've got the climate change cult of Albo and Bowen flying in separate jets to tell us why they're spending $1 billion of our money on green energy. It takes the meaning of the word hypocrisy to dizzying new heights. And this from bumbling Bowen, who thinks his carbon footprint is OK, but the rest of us have to cut emissions. I mean, listen to the praise the PM had for him at that very press conference. We have a minister with vision in Chris Bowen. Uh, I applaud the work that uh, Minister Bowen has done. A minister with vision. It's a clown show. Well, his vision is just as impaired as Albo's. Because here is where it gets more tricky for Labor. Bowen was trundled out for the media this morning to try and weasel the government out of the private jet mess. The Air Force advised that the most efficient way of getting the Prime Minister and two Cabinet Ministers to uh, the Liddell Power Station uh, was to go to Scone Airport where the runway was not rated for the Prime Minister's normal large jet. As you know, the Prime Minister always travels uh, with the Royal Australian Air Force. All Prime Ministers have for living memory, as long as certainly I've been involved. Uh, that's for security reasons and quite appropriate. The Prime Minister has a large jet available to him. That would normally be what we take. Uh, the runway at Scone wasn't strong enough to take the large jet, so the Air Force recommended and took the decision for two small jets. So Labor is pointing the finger at the RAAF as Bowen then goes on to explain. Even the small jets uh, weren't fully laden because of the weight restrictions. We limited the number of staff, uh, and even then, that's, that was the uh, Air Force advice, the most efficient way of getting us there. But it just gets more confusing, because Ray Hadley on 2GB subsequently discovered that the RAAF only act at the request of the Prime Minister. I have an email from someone who was an employee in the area that tasked VIP Air Force aircraft. And he says, with some clarity, and I have confirmed it, I can politely say that the Prime Minister obviously doesn't know how the system works. 
Ray, the Royal Australian Air Force does not provide assets until all approvals are provided to tasks directed by the PM's department. So we're directed by the PM's department to supply aircraft at their request. So the Air Force does not provide resources until tasked by the PM. Now, I've done a quick Google search of the Falcon 7X plane, and according to the Air Force's official website, the 7X has a standard crew of three pilots, co-pilot and crew attendant, and can carry up to 14 passengers. It also has a range of up to 11,000 kilometres. So let's get this right. It's capable of flying non-stop for 12 hours. It can fly from Los Angeles to Paris. And Albo and Co were just flying Canberra to Scone on two planes with a combined capacity of 28 people. And it gets even more tricky for Labor because after the PM and Co arrived in Scone, they drove 50 kilometres to Liddell for the press conference. Well, there were no Commonwealth cars in Scone. So where did the cars come from? Did they travel up from Sydney 300 kilometres away or Canberra? 550 k's, so more emissions and more ducking and weaving by Labor. Albo and his so-called visionary minister, Bowen, have been caught out. They have the nerve to lecture us on renewables, yet our power bills are still going up. All the while, they are spending our purse travelling in two gas-guzzling private jets to the same place. If you're going to talk the green energy talk, you've got to walk the walk. And we know we can't believe anything Albo says, because remember this, Furphy. My word is my bond. There are more questions than answers. The electorate can see sort of th right through this sorts of hypocrisy. And I think as we get closer to the election, they're going to continue to see through this hypocrisy from this government that's very much do as I say, not as I do. You would have to question, firstly, is the private jet the best use of money? But secondly, if both of them are going to the same destination and the same event to the same venue, why are they on the same private jet? And not to mention, it also presents a broader problem about Polly's travel entitlements. Remember when Workplace Relations Minister Tony Burke or Pay On Your Purse Tone went on a four-day spending spree with your money to the tune of over 50 grand on a trip to the US. And Defence Minister and VIP flyer Richard Miles spent $3 million of taxpayers' money on plane travel since the last election. They just get off scot-free. Minimal scrutiny over multiple incidents. This government is treating us like mugs. It's one rule for the left and another for the rest of us. Head to Canberra now for tonight's political headlines with Sky News political reporter Cam Redden. A red wave in Western Australia helped deliver Labor a majority government, but news poll analysis shows that support is on the slide, falling six points on two-party terms, giving the coalition a narrow lead. Some are going to go up, some are going to go down. Um, that's a fact of life. Labor leads 52 to 48 nationally, but is neck and neck with the coalition in New South Wales for the first time since election day. Female voters narrowly favour Labor, while males are evenly split. I think at the next election, most likely thing is probably a hung parliament, I think, which is going to be anarchy. From public polls to private planes, Energy Minister Chris Bowen has defended using a separate jet to the Prime Minister for a visit to the Hunter Valley. The Prime Minister has a large jet available to him. That would normally be what we take. Uh, the runway at Scone wasn't strong enough to take the large jet, so the Air Force recommended and took the decision for two small jets. All of us in elected office should always be mindful that every dollar we spend is coming from someone and it's coming from a taxpayer. Back on the ground, the government is confident its rollout of charging stations for electric vehicles will keep pace with rising demand. Two thirds of the EVs on the road today were sold under the Albanese government, so EV charging needs to keep up. There are now 900 fast charging stations nationwide, servicing almost 200,000 EVs. The government wants one port for every 150 kilometres on major highways. We don't have the infrastructure in my community at the moment. There's maybe two or three 
uh, charging stations in an area that's two and a half thousand square kilometres. You can get anywhere you want in Australia. You just do have to plan ahead. The next step for us is getting to a point where that planning goes away. Now, there's plenty of other news around today, so helping me get through it all is political reporter Cam Redden, who joins us now live. Cam, good to see you. Let's start with the fallout from Labor's failed immigration bill last week, which now seems to be shrouded in even more doubt over what it would actually achieve. We know from that late-night Senate hearing last week that this won't apply to current High Court cases and... Now it's not even clear if the minister in charge will blacklist entire countries, as was thought to be the intention of this legislation. Cam, it just seems like one big mess. What's the latest today? And is it any clearer, clearer what Minister Giles and O'Neill actually intend to achieve here? Yeah, it was a bit of a surprise, Danica, last week when we first got this legislation and got to go through it, that there was an, a, a, the inclusion of mandatory minimum sentences of one year for anybody who was deemed not to be a, a legitimate refugee, who the government wanted to deport, but was then refusing to go home. Mandatory minimums are something that Labor has argued against in various settings in the past. Even Claire O'Neill has said previously many years ago that mandatory minimums do not work. The government, though, is adamant that there is a sense of urgency around this legislation, that it needs to add a tool to the, the, the toolkit, to borrow the phrase. And much of this, Danica, points to this pending hearing of the High Court to do with a case known as ASF-17. This is an Iranian man who is challenging his detention. He claims that he wants to be out in the Australian community and that if he was to be deported, sent home to Iran, that he would face persecution on the basis of his sexuality. So that hearing is set for later this month on April 17. The government arguing it needs these laws in place to deal with whatever the case might be, and it does not want to get caught out in the event that the, it loses another case and more detainees, potentially upwards of 100, may need to be released as a result. The Coalition, though, is simply not buying that argument, and that's why we didn't see the laws pass Parliament last week. The Coalition, as well as the Greens, say they have not made the case, they being the government, that this is as urgent as they say it is, and that's why we're in this situation now where the government... Well, Parliament doesn't sit for six weeks and the government is saying it needs to find a way to get these laws through. Well, this is the exact problem now, isn't it, Cam? How likely do you think we are to see a session of Parliament be called before the budget to actually deal with this legislation? Well, it's possible. It's happened before, Danika, in this Parliament. We saw Parliament call back a couple of weeks before Christmas in 2022 to pass the caps on gas prices. So there is something of a precedent when the government is able to convince the Coalition or the Greens that there is a real urgent pressing need to get this legislation through. But a couple of dates are pretty important. I mean, we're through Easter now. This week's pretty much a write-off. Then there's one more week. And then that hearing in the High Court is on the 17th. So between now and the budget, it's possible that the government could try and squeeze in one more week. But more likely, the Coalition at this rate is very happy to just kick this off to a Senate inquiry. That inquiry is due to report back on May the 7th. So unless there's a quick rush before the budget to pass legislation between the 7th of May, when that uh, inquiry uh, hands down its report and the budget is delivered on the 14th of May, one week later... Kind of hard to see how that happens. So possible, Danica, but the government's going to really need to hit the phones and make that case if they want Parliament brought back. Mm. OK, well, it remains to be seen. Now, Cam, I spoke about the hypocrisy of Chris Bowen's jet-setting in my editorial, but he's also come under fire today for the government's use of non-disclosure agreements when it comes to working with industry on legislation. Now, Cam... We, of course, saw the motoring industry uproar at Bowen's first iteration of the vehicle emissions standard. Do you think this use now of NDAs is a way of trying to silence those critics? Well, in this particular case, Danica, Chris Bowen argues that the car companies wanted this. They wanted to use this as basically a way to make sure that commercially sensitive information could be raised, they could have these discussions with the confidence there wouldn't be a flow of leaks coming out or there wouldn't be a drip feed uh, in, the, in the public forum, and then they could come up with better policy. That's sort of the thinking behind it. But the broader point of the number of NDAs that have been used as part of these different negotiations, whether it is industrial relations or the reforms around the NDIS, for example, a point has been made around that, about, well, where is the balance and what is the right balance between making sure that, yes, certain um, contributors have the, the cloak of 
anonymity, if you like, or the protection of being able to speak honestly. Some that sign those NDAs feel that that is the best way to get the better result and better legislation because they can raise their issues in a private forum. However, others who are locked out of that NDA process say, well, that's actually too high a price to pay. We need to have the gears turn in the public and see how these decisions are made. And if you don't sign on, you can feel left out and left in the dark. So it's a balance across the board. The argument in this particular case, though, Danica from Chris Bowen, is that the car companies wanted it and therefore he was happy to oblige. Well, I'm not so sure I believe that. Uh, it's quite extraordinary to, to backflip like that. But anyway, Cam, I'll get into today's news poll and what it means for Labor a little bit later, but it certainly wasn't good news and not smiles for the Coalition either. Dutton's made inroads on Labor's primary, but at this rate, the Coalition would still only take two seats off Labor in WA and New South Wales, while the status quo would remain in South Australia, Queensland and Victoria. Cam, this could mean a Labor minority, but it still shows Dutton has some work to do, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, winning a couple of seats here and there, Danica, is just not going to be enough for the Coalition at the next election. And the numbers don't always tell the full story, but I think the simple numbers tell most of the story in this case. You need 76 seats in the House of Reps to govern in your own right. Labor has 78. The Coalition has 55, presuming they hold on to Cook in the by-election in a couple of weeks, which they most likely will. So they're 21 seats off the grand final victory, if you like, the Coalition. That is just not going to be chewed up with a couple of seats in WA, a couple of seats in Western Sydney. Even if you, you mark up those ones in, in WA, like Tandy and Hasluck, say they pick up Reid and Benelong and make an inroads in one or two of the Teal seats, say they take back Curtin in WA, 21 is a big mountain to climb here. And it shows that even though we're more or less neck and neck, it's a stronger position for the government to be in here given the stronger vote for the Greens will likely help them and flow back their way through preferences. Just one point I think is worth making on these numbers in today's Australian too with the news bold Danica is the, the growing influence of the rental vote. We don't always put people in pigeonholes in Australia and think about, you know, the, the, the female vote or the male vote, for example. But the impact of the renters' vote, I think, is really growing here. We can see from these numbers today, look at how high the Greens are polling. Keep in mind that one third of Australians are renting. So the Greens polling basically neck and neck with the coalition on primary vote when it comes to renters, a third of the, the adult voting population. And when that vote flows back into the two-party preferred terms, Labor is ahead 63 to 37 on two-party. It's a thumping. So the Greens have really looked to, to make a space for themselves amongst renters, people that are disillusioned. We've seen the, gov the opposition, I should say, try and tap in with rent... Uh, yeah things like um, accessing your super to, to get into a first home and things like that. But that growing Greens vote amongst renters is really troubling for the coalition. Yes, it can chew up the Labor vote, but it ultimately, much of it flows back to Labor. So that is an added challenge for the coalition as it works on its policy platform ahead of next year. It's extraordinary. It's like they're isolating the younger vote. And we will have more analysis on that later in the show. Cam Redden, good to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, stay with us coming up after the break. The figures are in and Australia's housing supply simply isn't keeping pace with immigration. Now, this is probably no big surprise, but the gap between arrivals and new homes is truly staggering. Plus, how can Penny Wong, on the one hand, call allegations against a UN aid agency serious while still reinstating taxpayer funding? It just doesn't stack up. More on that shortly. Welcome back to the program. Well, if it wasn't already apparent that we are paying the price for a big Australia, a new report has highlighted just how much we're lagging behind when it comes to infrastructure keeping pace with immigration, in particular housing. New data by the Institute of Public Affairs shows over the past financial year there were fewer than 149,000 new dwellings despite 530,000 arrivals. Now, if we work off the assumption that roughly each new dwelling is occupied by two and a half people, there is still a shortfall of just under 63,000 homes. Joining me now to discuss this is the Executive Director at the Institute of Public Affairs, Scott Hargraves. Scott, thanks for joining us on the program. We know the federal government has control of the migration levels, but at every state level, there is a shortfall in housing. So who is to blame here? 
Well, it's, it is about supply and demand. And when it comes to the restrictions on housing supply, our inability as a nation to deliver housing at anything like the rate we need, all levels of government are to blame. There's no doubt about that. The IPA forecasts that the shortfall over the five years to 2028 is something like 250,000 homes. But when it comes to the demand side, the, the migration levels, that is solely the preserve of the federal government. And what we're seeing now uh, is virtually an out of control migration program. Uh, they're just a, when we're putting the brakes on building houses, the federal government is putting the accelerator on the program to bring in new arrivals at a rate that we just cannot cope with. And that's why Australians are getting very worried about this program and even have said uh, in a survey that we conducted that 60% of Australians would rather see a pause in the program until we could get the housing infrastructure flowing at the rate that it should. Well, and this is the problem, isn't it? Because the current number is unsustainable. Australia welcomed something along the lines of 2,000 migrants a day in the year to September last year. That, that's an extraordinary figure, despite Albo telling us that he's actually got to bring the numbers down. But debate on the matter is stifled. Politicians don't want to be seen as being racist. But clearly, we're crying out for serious policy on this. It is time for people to speak up. Perhaps they have been concerned about being racist. Perhaps there's been too many voices from short-term thinkers in the business community who just want to see more and bigger numbers. Uh, economists who want to see the uh, GDP figures pumped up. Uh, but some people are speaking up. We've seen Dan Tien in the Coalition is speaking up, other politicians in the Federal Parliament. And you need to be brave enough just to call it out and not be fearful of being uh, called... Uh, racist simply because you're saying this migration program is beyond any level that we've seen in Australia in any comparable period and it's out of control and it's time something was done. Absolutely. And you mentioned a shortfall of about 250,000 homes, which is, is an astonishing figure. And we know that Labor's goal is to build 1.2 million homes in the next five years. That's already been labelled a fantasy by building groups. We'll actually be lucky to get 100,000 new builds this year alone. But even if Labor could reach its goal, Scott, would it even scratch the surface given the current immigration numbers? Well, I don't think we should lose the point that that is uh, a goal that is absolutely unachievable. It's, it's almost a, a Soviet-style idea where you simply increase the target, but you've got exactly the same policies in place, the exact same restrictions on housing supply. You're making life harder for builders. Builders are going bankrupt uh, in this country. Uh, this is not an environment where you're going to see the sort of investment that we need. Um, the number of new dwelling approvals for private uh, in the private sector is under 100,000 for the first time since 2013. Things are actually getting worse not better. So uh, it's very much a hypothetical number, I'm afraid. Well, that's it. I mean, houses are not being built. That's what the, the latest figures show us. And if you're a young person, for example, or someone looking into to looking to break into the housing market, Scott, this data really doesn't fill you with much hope. Well, the great thing about young people is they should always have hope. <laughs> keep working hard, keep saving. If you're renting, that's OK, but don't uh, back politicians who are going to give you short-term solutions. Otherwise, you'll be renting for your entire life. You'll have your money tied up in a super fund. You'll be living in uh, a big apartment complex owned by the super fund that's sitting on the money that you've contributed. What we need is longer-term policies that can get Australians into homes, that can let them access their super for deposits, uh, let them take control of their own lives, form families, enjoy the Australian way of life. So I would say to young Australians, hang on to that hope, do what you can, and also start making politicians accountable because they're the ones that are making sure that you haven't been able to afford a home and there's no reason why that needs to be the case. Yeah, spot on. That's really, really good advice, Scott. Uh, overall, though, how much more can the government keep hiding behind its immigration data? We know that immigration is currently helping prop up areas of this economy. It's been labelled a Ponzi scheme. But realistically, without it, Australia would be in a recession. How long can we hide behind it? Well, I think this is where the federal government just needs to start getting honest with Australians. They need to be honest that they've lost control of the migration program. And they also need to be honest that for the average Australian, 
uh, we're already in a recession. What we've got is a per capita recession for four quarters in a row for an entire year. Uh, on the uh, per capita figures for GDP actually went backwards. So the federal government has to be honest. If they're just going to say we're pursuing immigration solely so that we can brag about uh, the top line GDP growth numbers so that we can go off to, to Davos or the UN or whatever and say, look at our economic growth numbers. Uh, if that's what they want to do, they need to be honest about that because it's disguising the recession, which is the lived experience of the average Australian. Absolutely. As I said, it's been labelled really just as a Ponzi scheme. Scott Hargraves, we have to leave it there. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Now, I want to return to Labor's controversial decision to resume funding for the UN aid body UNRWA, even after accusations that staff were involved in the October 7 terror attacks. The decision, which no doubt has appeased the Labor left, caused uproar among the Jewish community and puts us at odds with the US, who are still withholding funding. For her part, the Foreign Minister Penny Wong was still defending that decision yesterday. There's two things about UNRWA which you know, are both true. Uh, one is uh, that UNRWA is uh, necessary uh, as the, the, the vehicle to get aid into Gaza where people are starving. I, think, I don't think there's, there's any dispute that you know, UNRWA is the best way and the only organisation with the capacity to deliver on the ground in Gaza at this time. Uh, second point is that the allegations were serious and then they, they required action. Uh, that's why I suspended the funding. Joining me now to discuss this is Liberal Senator and former Ambassador to Israel, Dave Sharma. Senator, good evening. Thanks for joining us on the show. How can the Minister describe the allegations against UNRWA as serious while still continuing funding and yet still standing by that decision? Well, that's exactly the right question. I mean, the allegations are serious. The Foreign Minister accepts that. UNRWA has not been given a clean bill of health. There's two UN investigations underway into UNRWA's complicity in the October 7th the terrorist attacks. Neither of those have concluded yet. So how Australia can reach a conclusion about UNRWA's fitness for purpose and links to terrorist organisations before the UN's own internal investigations have done uh, is a question that has no answer. And the Foreign Minister today did not give a, an answer in her interview. No, well, she certainly didn't give an answer, and you're right, that report still hasn't been handed down, so it's extraordinary that the Australian government could come to this conclusion. Uh, now, Senator, the claim is that UNRWA is the only organisation on the ground equipped to provide aid to Gaza. Do you think this is correct, or are there alternatives? No, that's absolutely not correct. And uh, countries like the United States, which, incidentally, Joe Biden just signed into bill a law preventing the US from funding UNRWA for at least another year. But countries like the United States are channelling aid through organisations like the Red Cross, like the World Food Program, like UNICEF. These are organisations that were not involved in the 7th of October terrorist attacks that do not have Hamas terrorists on their payroll uh, and that are concerned with providing immediate humanitarian relief to Gaza. So there are alternatives for Australia to fund, and that's what we should be doing, rather than funding an organisation whose links to Hamas are proven and clear and is are yet to reform and address those allegations. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there have been protests across Israel over the weekend by families of hostages taken by Hamas's outrage turns towards Prime Minister Netanyahu for not striking a ceasefire deal and seeing more hostages returned. Uh, we have already seen fractions in the war cabinet over there and concerns over the drafting of ultra-Orthodox Jews. Do you think Netanyahu's grip on power here is in jeopardy? Well, look, I just say up front that firstly, the hostages should be released and returned unconditionally. Now, the taking and holding of hostages is a, is a clear war crime. Hamas is already guilty of that and they should be returned without any condition, without any uh, linkages or, or anything else. Um, undoubtedly, though, the fact that, you know, 130 or 110 hostages are still being held, we don't know in what condition, we don't know how many are alive now, but almost... Up six months now after this, uh, these terrorist attacks is is horrific, and understandably, political pressure in Israel is is growing, especially from the hostages' families, but from others, that these people are still not have not been returned, and that their whereabouts and their health is unknown.
But do you think that Netanyahu has indeed done enough to prioritise the release of hostages? Well, look, it's I've got to say it's a very difficult dilemma because on the one hand you want to have the hostages released, but Hamas's terms for that are end of war, leave us in power, allow us to regroup and be prepared to launch another offensive like this. Clearly that is intolerable and not in Israel's national interests. Um, Hamas has not been able to come to reasonable terms. I mean, I guess no surprise that they are a terrorist organisation that's committed to the destruction of Israel. But in that situation, you'd have to say that Israel's only strategy is to continue to put military pressure on Hamas to put pressure on them to release the hostages, and, and that's what they're doing. But this is, yeah, this is a difficult dilemma, and it's a terrible, you know, organisation that they're dealing with in Hamas. This would test any democratic government anywhere around the world. Absolutely. It is a very, very difficult situation. But in regards to those protests, it was apparently one of the biggest anti-Netanyahu protests seen in, in recent years. Do you think that he could be forced to force his hand on this and, and try and strike that ceasefire deal? Look, I think, to state the obvious, I mean, there's a huge number of Israelis that have been focused, obviously, on their survival and recovering the hostages over the last six months. But there's also a number who want an explanation for the security failures of the 7th of October uh, and the failures of the government, of which Netanyahu is the leader. Uh, and there will need to be a reckoning for that. And what we're seeing, I think, with the resumption of these protests, um, not only about the hostages, but also about other domestic political issues in Israel, go to the heart of accountability for the Prime Minister. And, look, he faces a challenging set of political circumstances. He remains the Prime Minister, but, you know, if you looked at opinion polls, you'd realise that he's not a particularly popular one right now. No, clearly not. But regardless, as you said, it's a very tough situation. Senator Sharma, thank you for joining us this evening on the show. Well, coming up after the break, is the Coalition finally making inroads with younger voters as the polls look more dire for Labor? Plus, last I checked... Private jets weren't good for the environment, but I guess when you're Chris Bowen on a climate crusade, that doesn't matter. Welcome back. I'm Danika DiGiorgio, filling in tonight for Peter Credlin. Well, let's bring in tonight's panel now, former Liberal MP Gary Hardgrave and the Director of the Centre for Youth Policy at the Menzies Research Centre, Freya Leach. Good evening. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us on the show Hi, this Danica. evening. Good to see you. Now, look, I want to start with the latest news poll figures that came out today. Uh, and it is more bad news for Labor. The Coalition leads Labor 37% to 33% on primary voting as support plunges in Western Australia, but younger voters have also swung away from Labor with support growing for the Liberals and Nationals. However, Labor does still lead to party preferred. Freya, why do you think Labor has lost their appeal now among younger voters? I think a lot of people in my generation have woken up to the fact that the Labor Party is run by a bunch of inner city lefty boomers who are fighting the culture wars of yesterday. <laughs> Nothing Hold exemplifies on. this more than their hatred of nuclear energy. And that is ironic because the majority of Gen Z supports at least considering nuclear as part of our energy mix. I also think that young people are starting to realise that Labor actually takes their votes for granted. We see in their migration policy, for example. Yes. They are failing to consider the impact that this might be having on my generation. For every one house that we're building, we're getting four new migrants. Wow. So if you're a first home buyer like me, you're looking at this going, there is no way I will ever be able to afford a home. And young people hate that. It's impossible, isn't it? And then the other problem is, is that approvals are actually going down. So houses are not being built anyway. Exactly. In a high inflation environment with consistent supply chain shortages, labour market shortages, this the whole economic environment, it feels like it's all deteriorating and that is impacting young people the most. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, that, that's exactly why voters are just turning away. Gary, it's interesting because Western Australia, it's mining heartland and yet WA voters yeah. are clearly not happy with what they're seeing. Why do you think that is? 
Well, when I was in Canberra, I always found that Queenslanders and West Australians got on really well because we dig stuff out of the ground and we create the wealth uh, for the rest of the country. And Queenslanders, I always say, have got great BS detectors. So have WA people. And <laughs> so they've worked it out. They've, uh, they've seen this bloke and they realise he's not real. He's not doing the right thing. And they invested a fair bit of protest vote into the Albo government at the last election. My suspicion is the buyer's remorse is pretty thick on the ground. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I don't think Western Australia is going to fall for it again. Well done. No, exactly. Peter Dutton's been there a long time, a lot, a lot of times too. So, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a big vote of confidence for Dutton. Keep going back to the Western Australia people, I reckon, Peter. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm from WA myself, Gary, so I'd like to put myself yep. in that category uh, as well that you just said. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, <laughs> now, look, I spoke <laughs> about this at the top of the show, Anthony Albanese and Chris Bowen yeah. taking separate private jets to the Hunter Valley to announce a renewable energy initiative last week. And the irony in that is extraordinary, about as extraordinary as Albo describing Bowen, as a, Bowen as a visionary at that very press conference. But in case you <laughs> missed it, this was Chris Bowen today actually blaming the Air Force. Even the small jets uh, weren't fully laden because of the weight restrictions. We limited the number of staff uh, and even then that's, that was the uh, Air Force advice, the most efficient way of getting us there. Gary, what an embarrassment. Does Bowen's explanation here stack up or is this blatant hypocrisy? Well, of course it's blatant hypocrisy, but it's Airbus Albo's flying circus and this bloke is the clown. <laughs> this, this fellow has such a smugness about him. There is nothing that he can do that is absolutely wrong. I thought he liked EVs. I thought he liked electric vehicles. I, I'm agnostic about what's under the front of the, the car, under the hood, but surely he should have put a vote of confidence in place and driven there. Surely he should mm. have done that. But I oh, know you have a plane, I'll have a plane. He still is smarting for the fact that he was elected leader, even though he was acting leader at one stage uh, between elections. Uh, this bloke is a real problem. He is the albatross in Airbus Albo's <laughs> army and uh, he will have to go. He will just have to go. Well, that's it. It's hard to define now. As you said, does he like electric vehicles? Is he uh, about renewables or <laughs> is he about gas guzzling jet sprayer? It's now impossible to tell. They lecture us about carbon emissions and then they go and take two jets to scone in regional New South Wales. It's insane. But look, I can't say I'm particularly surprised that Chris <laughs> Bowen did this because he's clearly no, Albo's absolutely. worst performing minister. <laughs> clearly. He's ignorant about nuclear energy. He lies to us consistently about the impact that his policy will have on our power prices mm -hmm. and now he's showing that he takes the Australian public to be a bunch of fools. Exactly. And I don't know about you but I am so yeah. fed up with politicians lecturing us about the need to reduce emissions and then flying around on private jets. Oh, it's hypocrisy. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It is absolutely, yeah, yeah. it is absolutely, but, yeah. but apparently he's a visionary, a, vi a visionary minister as he's been described. <laughs> Honestly, it, it is a clown show, Gary, yeah. as you said. Now, like from Mr. Like, mis like Mr. Magoo. Like Mr. <laughs> Mr Magoo, the clown show rolls into camera, doesn't it? Now, from planes to trains, experts say the ambitious inland rail project between Melbourne and Brisbane could be doomed to be another white elephant. Political infighting, poor planning and increasing delays on environmental approvals mean the project has stalled with just 17% completed, while the cost has blown out from $9.3 billion to more than $31 billion. Gary, rail is an important part of our freight network, but should this project have even been given the green light in the first place? Well, of course it should have. It's been talked about for 100 years. The original plan was Melbourne to Longreach and then a branch line to Townsville and a branch line to Darwin. It was actually about opening up the frontier of the east coast of Australia. Uh, but it's been completely muffed. And I've got to say, I chaired for a while the Community Consultative Committee for the last part into Brisbane. But it was using the existing rail track and it's been four or more years that the Queensland government have been looking at an existing rail track to decide what the environmental impact of the existing rail track being used for inland rail would be. The Queensland government have completely killed this stone dead. It takes five to eight years to get approvals of every, anything. Western Australia is just as bad, Danica, by the way, because Gina Reinhart, she had to fill in thousands of forms to build the Roy Hill mine in the biggest mining state of Australia, the biggest iron ore state in the world, and, and yet she still had to fill in thousands of forms. 
we are killing ourselves with the, the process that we are bringing to, to bear on everything. Uh, inland rail is a good idea. It's time, though, hasn't come yet. And, yep, they've killed it. They've killed it, the mm. Queensland government in particular. Yeah, they've absolutely uh, botched that one. Now, this is interesting because despite 64% of South Australians saying no to a national Indigenous voice to Parliament, uh. the state government decided <laughs> not to listen and pushed ahead with one anyway. And how's this? Only 10% of eligible voters actually cast a ballot in the South Australian voice election. Uh, Freya, the government's out there claiming this was a grand success. Do you think 10% voter turnout is a success? Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure by what measure we are measuring this. I think it's pretty clear when the very people that are supposed to be empowered by this voice do not even care enough to come out and vote for it, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not actually meeting the real needs in the community. And we as Australians exactly. know that. During the referendum, we voted to reject this form of separate development that entrenches division and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why the South Australian government has not woken up to this fact and realised this is not the way forward. Yep, exactly. And this is the problem. Yep. We voted no to that division, Gary, yet South Australia is just forging its own pathway here. Yeah, there's 1.7 million people in South Australia, 50,000 of them identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So that's about 3% of the population. So what we're hearing statistically is only 0.3% of the population voted in a referenda that's going to give them 100% control of the money. Uh, there is something really farcical about this. Danica, there are more people who are left-handed in South Australia than there are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. One in 10 people are left-handed. I think we need a voice for them. We really do. I mean, Peter <laughs> Dutton's left-handed and Tony Abbott's left-handed, so I guess they kind of, you know, get away with the representation. But this is farcical and it's, mm. it's really... It's bad news. It's virtue signalling mm. at the taxpayers' expense, as usual. Yeah, as usual. We see it over and over again. Now, experts are warning the government that the job seeker system of reporting job applications isn't working because underqualified people are applying for executive jobs just to tick off their requirements and get their welfare payment. It comes mm. after job agencies were forced to return more than $8 million in taxpayer funds due to a surge in faulty claims of placing clients into work or training. Freya, it seems like there's been quite an oversight here. Does there need to be a shake-up of the system? I think this just proves what we know to be true. Everyone loves a free lunch yeah. and whenever you're giving out free money, people are going <laughs> to want to abuse that system. Always, always. And that's the problem that we're facing. But the real challenge is there are currently 360,000 job vacancies in our country. 20% of businesses around the place are reporting vacancies. So why are people not applying for those jobs. So what is the issue? What's the, is there some sort of matching system we need to create? I don't know, but I think this is such a shame and it, yeah, it just proves what we know to be true, basically. It is. You're so spot on. There's so many jobs available. What is going on? Gary and Freya, we've got to leave it there, unfortunately. Thank you so much for joining us on the panel Thank this you. evening. Well, stay with us after the break. We'll cross live to London for an update on the King. who managed to attend an Easter service amid the cancer shock for the royal family. That's next. Well, King Charles has attended his first royal event since his shock so cancer going. diagnosis. Yeah. The monarch and oh. Queen Camilla appeared at an Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel in Windsor. Witnesses say the King looked well and was in good spirits. For more, let's bring in Talk TV royal editor Sarah Hewson. Sarah, thanks for joining us. It really was great to see the King out and about, of course, as he receives his cancer treatment. Was this a surprise appearance by the monarch? Uh, great to see you, Danica. Buckingham Palace had in fact announced the King's appearance at the Easter Sunday service about a week in advance. We didn't know whether that was going to happen or not. It was all dependent on doctors' advice. But I think it's an encouraging sign and cautious first steps uh, towards him making some kind of return uh, to public life. Of course, he's been carrying on his duties, but very much behind closed doors. The only glimpses we've got of him are, are photographs, maybe the odd video or, or him in a car. But to see him out and about yesterday joining uh, members of the family at St George's Chapel in Windsor was a really positive sign. Absolutely. And he looked to be smiling. He looked very happy. And, and Sarah, he even ventured into the crowd to, to greet the well-wishers. 
Yeah, and that was more of a surprise, uh, Zanika, because he's been so protected and kept away from members of the public while he's going through his uh, cancer treatment because, of course, it has an impact on your immune system. But yesterday, you could see how happy he was to be out and about, greeting the crowds, shaking hands uh, with those members of the public who were asking him how he was doing. They told him to get well soon. He said, I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, my favourite encounter came with one lady who uh, told him that Camilla was now 17. And when uh, the king looked a bit bemused, she pointed down to her, her pet dog, a, a King Charles, uh, Cavalier King Charles uh, Spaniel, and he said, well, you're going to have to get a new one uh, soon, aren't you? And you could just see the fact that he was so relieved to be back doing the things that he enjoys most. And that old adage from the late Queen, you have to be seen to be believed, that was very much uh, in line with that yesterday. Uh, good to see that sense of humour has not gone away. Now, Sarah, there were plenty of royals in attendance, but... There were some notable absences, of course, uh, one of them being Princess Catherine as, as she undergoes treatment for cancer herself. Yes, and when uh, Kate had announced that she had been diagnosed with cancer, it was made clear by Kensington Palace that the Wales family would be heading away for the Easter break to their home in Norfolk, and they would not be joining the rest of the royal family for the traditional Easter Sunday service. And what we saw yesterday was kind of Easter light, a very much smaller gathering than normal. This, apart from Christmas, is one of the most uh, significant moments for the royal family to get together at Windsor. And actually, we saw a, a smaller group of them. And we understand that because the king is, is trying to keep away from too many people, there wasn't the same big family lunch or big family gathering afterwards. But nonetheless, really, really good to see him back out and about. And I think the plan now is subject to his health, uh, we will start to see him taking part, particularly in the summer months, uh, in some more public events. The commemoration of D-Day, for example, perhaps his uh, birthday parade, Trooping the Colour. And of course, Tanika, looking ahead to the autumn where he's due to be visiting Australia. Uh, well, just on that, Sarah, what's the likelihood, do you think, of him still coming down under as planned later this year? Well, Buckingham Palace not confirming anything at this stage. It is very much dependent on medical advice. But as I said, they are starting to put tentative plans in place. And uh, the signs we're seeing is that the treatment appears to be going uh, well. The fact that his doctors allowed him out yesterday was a really uh, good indication, I think. If he can get to Australia and if his doctors allow it, then I am certain that he will want to be doing that. He's got the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, uh, of course, as well. Uh, before that, we know that he's desperate uh, to get back to public life, frustrated that it's taking him a bit longer uh, than uh, he would have hoped. Just 17 months into his reign, it's been a really cruel blow. But if he can be there, I am certain that he will be. Yeah, look, fingers crossed. Uh, to see the King back out again, of course, he's been diagnosed with cancer, Princess Catherine's being diagnosed with cancer. We know, Sarah, there's been a, a lot of people saying, well, is the monarchy in crisis? Are they going to survive this? But how important was it for him uh, to be seen again, once again in public, to, to put those rumours to bed? Hugely important. And to see the return of the royal walkout was really significant something that was started by his mother, the, the late Queen. But if you remember back to the, the days after the Queen had died, that very first return by King Charles to Buckingham Palace, and he and Queen Camilla stopped the car uh, and they did a walkabout with the crowds. It was the first time that he'd heard God Save the King uh, sung out to him. He was very moved by that. And he is buoyed by the public engagements and interactions that he gets. It is certainly something that he tries to do on all of his engagements. So to be cooped up behind closed doors and only having these very small meetings, the audience with the Prime Minister, for example, uh, you know, a couple of meetings. He had five people into uh, Buckingham Palace last week for a meeting. But other than that, he really has been kept away from the public. And those are the kind of things that matter most, to be amongst his people, to be hearing from them, to be seeing them yeah. and to be yeah. seen. Yeah, it's incredible that he was back out. Good to see him. Sarah Hewson, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you for your company tonight. The Bolt Report is up next. Peter will be back tomorrow night at 6.